In this episode of Doje Feeder, enjoy an impressive teppanyaki feast that delight all senses. Check out cheerful ways to spruce up your home. Appreciate the intricate craftsmanship of Kashmiri pashmina shawls. And discover what true art is with the Hong Kong born design and branding tastemaker, Alan Chan. Kelly Jan, what's your favorite food? あの、私は食べ焼きが好きです。本さんは？私も手羽焼きが好きですけど、やっぱり一番好きなのはお寿司とラーメンです。あ、なるほど。Wow, Kelly is such a fast Japanese learner. You know your Japanese is actually getting so much better right now. あ、ありがとうございます、Telford. But I think you're the true Japanese master instead. Well, I think you're just so kind, Kelly. But speaking of Japan, what got you interested in Japanese culture in the first place? Mm, I think the Japanese spirit is what I truly adore. I always feel like the Japanese people have their own unique approach to things. No matter what they do, they plan and execute things in a really thoughtful manner. Don't you think? Well, I particularly like the Japanese drama and animation. But what I appreciate the most is the Japanese spirit of achieving everything with great attention to details. And it is especially prominent in their culinary culture. Hong Kong is a city in love with Japanese culture, especially with their food. From sushi to ramen, Japanese food has always been a crowd pleaser. A nice Japanese meal goes beyond just the seasonal ingredient and umami. Its culinary art and dining experience are equally appealing. Japanese grill often features an east meets west fusion. Take this oyster dish as an example. The chef here is cooking the Iwagaki oysters with a Western oyster Kirkpatrick recipe, bringing cheese sauce, crispy bacon, and oyster all in one bite. Teppanyaki chefs are also known for their incredible ways of seasoning, covered with kombu and a fast amount of sea salt. The abalone is grilled slowly to let the seasoning seep into the meat. The chef then complements the abalone with a sauce made of dashi and sea urchin to amplify the flavors further. The real charm of teppanyaki comes down to the experience. There are different temperature zones, even on the same grill table, and the range varies from 150 to 300 degrees Celsius. That's why heat control is an essential skill for any teppanyaki chef to master. And after all, that's how a melt-in-your-mouth sensation of the Wagyu beef is done. More than a feast for the taste buds, teppanyaki is also a theatrical performance. With the intimate setting, Chefs can showcase their cooking skills, share their stories, and even explain the smallest details of the menu with the guests. The whole experience is engaging and pleasurable. Mm, Helbert, actually, this is not my first tapanyaki experience for me. I remember I went for a full on seafood tapanyaki feast. 10 years ago. I thought it was amazing because the chef actually made a flaming volcano out of onions. It was an epic performance. But today's tapanyaki meal is quite different in terms of the use of ingredients as well as the cooking style. This is another level. Well, just like this angel hair noodle dish, you know, it features a Spanish red prawn dish and cheese. I think it's a perfect combination of Western and Japanese style of cooking. Absolutely. This awe-inspiring teppanyaki meal is rounded out with a bowl of homey fried rice. Different from the usual fried rice with spring onions and egg, the chef used Hokkaido sea urchin as the hero ingredient. Buttery in texture and briny in flavor, this bowl of rice is simply heavenly. Mm. 
Great things happen to those who never stop learning, and the same rule applies to the chefs too. As cooking is a lifelong commitment to learning different food cultures and culinary skills along the way. I'd say I'm quite a home person. If I don't have to work outside, I'd like to spend time at home, watching TV, spending time with my cats. So I think an ideal home is a space for me to totally relax. And aside from that, a home can also be a space for us to unleash our creativity. Adding seasonal twist to the home interior can lift the spirit and make our home fresh and inviting. Our wardrobes are not the only thing that needs seasonal twist from time to time. Learn about how to keep your home fresh and crisp this summer with a design insider. With over 30 years of experience working for home interior designs across the Middle East, Singapore, and Hong Kong, John is the best person to talk to in terms of the arts furnishing. Hello, John. Hello. I know you have been in the home interior design industry for over two decades, and with such extensive experience, what tips would you give to people who want to spruce up their home during the summer season? I think for the summer season, I would suggest just keeping it simple. Mm. Um, maybe clear out a few things, declutter a little bit, and then layer on some some cushions. Um, you know, bring in some color, a, a little a little bit of interest to the home for the summer. Maybe stay in the, the blues, greens, the, the the lighter, more softer tones. Mm -hmm. And in your opinion, what role does furniture play in home design? Well, for me, I think it's critical. It's, it's sort of the most uh, important part of, of all of the home design. I mean, you need to think about uh, what, how you live, how you use your space, and then you can uh, then layer on the personality on top of that. Furniture definitely offers a nice finishing touch to our homes. And when it comes to a visually appealing piece of furniture, I wonder what would the design guru pick? It's uh, sort of slightly retro, it's got some cane um, accents to it, it sits up on some um, black legs with uh, bronze feet, and I think it sort of is uh, on trend and on style right now and really looks uh, good in almost anybody's home. Mm -hmm. That's a really appealing collection, and how about when it comes to a favorite piece? Oh, an individual <laughs> piece. Um, or our custom cabinets that we do every year that are always uh, sort of a unique feature for us and exclusive exclusive to us here. Possibly the Julian sofa, which is brand new for us, which I actually have in my home. That's, mm -hmm. that's a nice piece. When it comes to designing home interior, before jumping into any steps, always start by choosing the right color palette to ensure consistency throughout the space. And what's next after that? Let's see what the expert has to say. And let's say someone is moving into a new place. What tips would you give to them in terms of decorating a new place? Uh, moving into a new place is a perfect opportunity to uh, step out of your comfort zone, do something different, maybe work with our interior design consultants. What are the different stages of interior design? I think when you're moving into a new home and, and sort of coming together with interior design, I think you need to look at layout, you need to look at um, how you use the space. How do you live? Do you live with uh, you know, family, kids, dog, do you entertain? And then from that, I think you can start building up um, the look, the feel, the layout, the color palettes that you're gonna look. And what do you look for in a good piece of furniture? Um, I think three things are important to me. Uh, comfort, style, and quality. And uh, I think without those three things together, you're never going to be satisfied with uh, a new piece of furniture, no matter what it is. What do you think is the next big thing in terms of furniture trend? Comfort is one of the things that people are really going to look for. People spend a lot of time at home recently, and I think they're really, really sort of understanding what is important in their home and what's important in furniture and I think comfort is one of those things that will be on everybody's uh, top of everybody's list. Sometimes interior design is more than the aesthetic. It can also influence your mood and behavior. So how about giving your home a seasonal makeover and make it summer ready? After the break, take a look at some beautiful pashmina scarves. Sit down with Alan Chan and see how he embraces art, culture and design in his daily life. How do 
identify a country from their landmarks, their food, or perhaps their signature products? History and culture have produced some very distinctive items. And when we think of a place like Kashmir, you know that you naturally think of pashmina shawls. Pashmina scarves have been for centuries an emblem of Kashmiri culture. With the ever-growing demand for pashmina shawls in the international market, the Kashmiri craft has even become a medium that connects people around the world to local artisans of the Kashmir Valley. Can you tell us why pashmina shawls are so highly prized? Pashmina shawls are made of finest Kashmir wool and is a uh, natural fiber. Oh, so they're not man-made. Can you tell us more? Yes, uh, because the, each the every pieces want to the fitting process to make the one shawl and the very skillful artisan to doing this one, the embroidery. Wow, and how long does it take them to complete one shawl? Uh, basically for the 10 days to two years to make. Two years? Yeah. That's a long, long time. Yeah, because this one for the cashmere, the very traditional the embroidery mm -hmm. and the very skillful the artisan can doing this one. Mm. What made the Kashmir shawl world famous is the meticulous and highly skilled work of weaving. The skill of weaving high-quality Pashmina shawls has been taught and passed down in Kashmiri weavers' families for generations. The woven tapestry-like design was actually produced with the use of the kani, a small bobbin carrying coloured yarn, which is something unique to the Kashmiri shawls production. Luxury Pashmina shawls are entirely made by hand. In the family atelier, you can always find two or three weavers sitting together using multiple carnies, interlacing the colored weft threads through the warp ends to produce intricate patterns according to the instructions given by the master weaver. So carnies isn't just a shawl, it is a piece of art. When you wrap yourself in a pashmina shawl, you're not just draping a piece of cloth on your body, rather you're adorning your body with an exquisite art piece, and I completely agree. What do you think? Well, speaking of like embroidery, I noticed that a lot of the shawls in here have some very distinct and unique patterns. How is a pattern created? Basically for the traditional pattern, for the big border, big paisley, but my design, I give the idea for the artisan, for the small flower, and small putty and the flower and the um, animal pattern. Right, yes, I noticed that. Yeah, I, I know that you design a lot of the shawls in here as well. And where do you get the inspiration for your designs? Uh, I also see the cashmere the book. Because the cashmere book has many patterns for the traditional the tea tree. Mm -hmm. It has the small flower and the very unique the pattern for the idea and color. Right, so you draw inspiration from some more traditional designs into your own modern interpretation. Yeah, because I understand that people like the modern fashion, so I like the, to get a multi the pattern and uh, my idea, the small flower, and uh, very easy to match. It is very easy to match, and they're beautiful. Yeah, so elegant. Over the years, the artisans developed an extensive and diverse design repertoire that utilizes a variety of stitches. Although variations have been added, the embroidery motifs of pashmina shawls have not changed much. The nature-inspired pattern is a perennial for the design of pashmina shawls, which has definitely stood the test of time, even become an important component of any family heirloom. By infusing traditional Kashmiri art with a modern sense of style, the shawls blend new life with traditional artisanry. Pashmina scarves are known for their softness and the way that they keep you warm. But in the end, I think it's the stories behind it all that will grasp you with its warmth. The rule of thumb for any designers, artists, or creators it's always to stay curious and never stop creating. And nothing quite beats meeting a true creative guru in person to learn more. Here you are, you're in my drawing room. And in this room, basically what you're looking at are my contemporary art collection. The major part of this room you will see are my collection of designer furniture. Where I'm sitting is actually a chair 
which I created maybe about four years ago, based on the Kyoto bamboo forest. The silhouette of the bamboo turned into a silhouette of a piece of art chair made of solid wallet, which two people can share, and we call it a conversation chair. Meet Alan Chen, a renowned designer, a brand consultant as well as an artist. 50 years in the creative business has taught him one big lesson, which is to share. And that's why he's opening up his cabinet of curiosities with us today, while sharing his own creative journey. Cheers. Hi, cheers. Thanks for coming. Yes, thank you for inviting. So, Alan, mm. as the master of design, what does creativity mean to you? Well, creativity to me means bringing better quality of life. Mm. I've come to this place a few times, but yeah. this time, it, you've changed it to a completely different kind of a, a, a tone, feel. How, how and why did you do it? I was trying to create a space, an atmosphere that even my, I myself have never experienced before. It's about life story, it's about the journey of life. And here you are, uh, th this is basically uh, all my inspiration uh, in one house. You come in, you, you, you're greeted by uh, a cabinet of curiosity with a mini museum. Then where we're sitting is a drawing room, display a contemporary art collection. Then there's a chef table, kitchen, some of my other collection of photography, in, all in black and white. And then you move into a big room where I call the music room, which house a lot of my collection from your old painting, contemporary all into one. I can see that you have a lot of collectibles from around the world and you are a big fan of traveling. And what do you like to buy the most? I mean, well, anything from a, <laughs> from, a, from an old stamp postcard yeah. to old poster to an old teacup. Recently, I've been collecting a blue and white plate mm -hmm. from um, Meiji and Edo period uh, from Kyoto. I fall in love with the blue and white yeah. with one single color and it can create such a dynamism of powerful images which a designer should learn. Mm, you can always find the beauty in things. Oh, everything, yes. a anything, anything. If you, I think it's not collecting, it's going to street market or even go auction house. It's not about seeing it. It's to reach out with your mind and heart. I think the best way is for me to show you the objects on stage. Yes. All right, let's, let's move go. on. Yes. Janice, in this cabinet, they're basically uh, silverware, we call them export silverware because they're all over 100 years old. In the good old days, uh, they were actually made in Japan, mm -hmm. Shanghai, uh, Canton, Hong Kong. I mean, during those times, there was no airplane, of course. So all these were shipped through the zero on the sea to European country. That's why when you look at them, the craftsmanship are all very Asian, but the silhouette of the teapot or the utensil, they are very European because they were exported for European market over 100 years ago. And I've been collecting them almost 30 years ago, and I have about almost 600 pieces of those. Wow. <laughs> well, here comes another cabinet of curiosity. Wow. Uh, you see, there are so many figurines here. Yes. I'm an old man now. I've gone through my life in different stages, different decades, and I believe I have played different role in my life. You know? mm. So this actually symbolized from a uh, cartoon character mm -hmm. to a Buddhist sort of figure, mm -hmm. to a finance guy, uh, to some kind of sort of gimmicky figurine. They all represent uh, who I am at certain stages of my life. Mm -hmm. And I've been collecting a lot of these figures unexpectedly. And now that after I display, display them in a box like this, it looks like a Journey of life. Yeah, so this is like a showcase of your life. Wow, well, I, I hope so. <laughs> <laughs> so, what do you think is the best part of being in the art industry? I think if you realize, if you want to be creative, I think you have to have a pure heart, mm -hmm. like a child. So anything that's original that is inspiring will become very powerful. Along your artistic journey, right. what do you think is the most important lesson that you've learned? I was somehow forced and trained to think out the box all the time because I'm a brand consultant. So uh, we have to deliver solution that able to drive, improve the business of my client. Mm -hmm. And sky's the limit, and I think that's important. There's nothing impossible. There's always a solution to anything uh, that we put in front of my desk, and I, I enjoyed that journey. And mm. if not a creator, what would you be instead? Wow, uh, 
I enjoy singing. Yes. I mean, in my in my second school day, I was I, was, I have a small group. I'm uh, one of the vocalists. I always believe uh, whatever creative you you are uh, arena you are in, whether it's graphic product, interior architecture, there's a rhythm in it, and the rhythm is actually can bring along through music, and music always bring a lot of sensational emotion to my design solution. Walking through Alan Chan's private collection is truly eye-opening. What impresses me the most is this music room. Not only is the interior design impressive, it is also a perfect blend of art, music and design. That's all the time we have for this week's episode. If you want to find out more about what we have introduced, remember to log on to our website. In the coming weeks, continue to enjoy all the beautiful things in life. We will chat with a passionate wine expert, take a seat in a modern and tastefully furnished restaurant, and savor Epicurean delicacies. Also step into the world of sustainable fashion and find out what this the word chic really means. Join us again next time for ways to be happier, healthier, and enjoy life more.